Welcome to episode 26 of the Fast Night by Fungi podcast. Today we will be debunking mushroom myths and misinformation. So there's a, a big problem with mushroom misinformation online in that the same stories get told over and over again, but rarely is there a critical take or look at that information. And I'm going to give you a heads up. This, this episode is going to be a little bit of the adult equivalent of me telling you that Santa does not exist. So what I say in this episode may challenge some of your thoughts or beliefs with regards to mushrooms. And what I want to convey is simply that I am taking a skeptical look at the information that's out there. Some of the things that have been said, particularly in popular media about mushrooms. Uh, and we're going to take a look together and I'm hopefully going to provide some counterpoints to the opinions that are out there and hopefully give you a couple references and other things you can go look at so you can start your own educational journey. So first of all, I want to thank North Spore for sponsoring this episode. Uh, they are a phenomenal mushroom company up in Portland, Maine. I get all of my cultivation supplies from them. I get a lot of kits and they have both smaller three pound kits and bigger five pound block kits and a lot of cool varieties of mushrooms. You can grow all these different kinds of oyster mushrooms, lion's mane, piapini, chestnut mushrooms, shiitake, reishi, uh, everything on the spectrum of edible to medicinal. They're a really phenomenal company. Uh, they have spawn and liquid culture and pre-sterilized substrate and all sorts of cool growth chambers. I've got my Norspore uh, Boom Room Martha tent upstairs and I've also got one of their uh, monotub bins and they're just a phenomenal selection of stuff on their website. So if you haven't visited Norspore.com, highly encourage you to do that. You can use code FASTEN by FUNGI in all caps to save 10% on your order. And that does help support me. So I appreciate uh, every order that you guys get from Norspore and use my code because it helps out me and, and the process of writing my book and doing this podcast and all this sorts of stuff. So uh, I also want to say that unfortunately, this is going to be my last episode, uh, at least in the current incarnation of Fascinated by Fungi podcast. Because the app where I record this, Colin, is shutting down in the next couple of months. And unfortunately, that means my podcast will probably get pulled off of Spotify, Google, Apple, etc. Uh, the episodes will remain on YouTube. And I'm going to upload all of the currently recorded episodes to my Patreon uh, with some notes on them. And I hope in the future I can get them all pushed back out to the streaming services. But if anyone knows how to run a podcast or is a producer in any kind of way, um, I could use some help. And so please feel free to reach out to me, uh, DM on Instagram, or shoot me an email, uh, fastnamebyfungi at gmail.com. So we're going to start out talking about mushroom myths. And the most common mushroom myths I hear are usually surrounding the fly agaric Amanita muscaria. So I've been professionally teaching people about mushrooms on the internet for about the last seven years, and I have heard virtually every piece of misinformation and common misconception that surrounds mushrooms, and Amanita muscaria is number one. So let's start talking about it. Um, this is a fairly common mycorrhizal mushroom that grows around the world. Uh, it is not rare, it is not threatened, it is not endangered. In fact, in many places it is invasive because it's gotten moved around as part of the lumber timber industry. Uh, and I know when I was in New Zealand, Amanita muscaria is by far one of the most common mushrooms I would see absolutely everywhere growing in huge numbers. And it is not native to New Zealand. It doesn't belong there. But it was introduced and is now naturalized. And that's the case around a lot of the world. So I've seen people get really upset if they see you cutting or touching or, or anyhow messing with a muscaria. Um, they're extremely common. Uh, they're also completely legal. So there is a perception that they might be illegal. And that is because this mushroom is both... Uh, toxic, trippy, and edible all at the same time, depending on how you process it. So I just want to say, in talking about this mushroom, it is fully legal. Um, for some weird reason, it's illegal in Louisiana, um, but I believe around the rest of the world and here in the rest of the United States, it's, it's a legal, normal mushroom uh, that just grows all over the place. So uh, some of the misinformation I've heard, and I'm going to say this, and these are the myths that you tend to hear about it, is that Amity muscaria is a, a trippy, psychedelic mushroom, and Vikings would take it before going into battle to throw themselves into a berserker rage at inspired red and white uh, Santa Claus because the shamans used to go around and give them out, and they would also associate with like flying reindeer because the reindeer would eat muscaria, and then people would drink the reindeer piss to get high. 
Um, so those are all, all the myths that you tend to hear around muscaria. So let me go through them sort of one by one and, and break them down and talk about them a little bit and provide some information uh, about this mushroom. So first of all, uh, it is toxic. It contains uh, isoaxles, uh, which is ibotenic acid and muscimol. So these are two toxic compounds that are in this mushroom. Despite the name, Amanita muscaria does not contain significant amounts of muscarine. That is in other uh, mushrooms and other amanitas, but it is not a significant component of Amanita muscaria. So that's one misunderstanding that people tend to have. Uh, ibotenic acid is a neurotoxin. And in, if you have a lot of it in your system, you can like poke holes in your brain. Uh, but generally you wouldn't eat a ton of it. But uh, <laughs> it can cause really severe GI upset. And that usually manifests as like puking, diarrhea. Um, but it's not usually deadly. I think there's like one or two isolated incidences of someone dying from amino muscaria. Uh, it was when they ate a tremendous amount of it raw and they probably died from just dehydration and throwing up and diarrhea and that kind of thing. But generally the toxin that's in amino muscaria is ibotenic acid and it's not deadly. It's not a death cap. It does not contain uh, the deadly toxic amatoxins. Um, so amino muscaria can be consumed as an edible mushroom. And if you want to do that safely, you can put it into water, bring it to a boil, pour that water out, put fresh water in, bring it to boil again, pour that water out. And at that point, you've probably taken out all the ibotenic acid from this mushroom and you can cook and eat it safely. Uh, muscaria is great, just kind of fried up in a little bit of butter. I did some recently where I finished it with uh, dashi and miso and a little mirin, um, some sake. It was a really nice, delicious way to eat this mushroom. I've also had it in a Amanita uh, muscaria ceviche. And that's a recipe from Chad Hyatt's book, The Mushroom Hunter's Kitchen phenomenal uh, book with lots of great recipes, but that's that's a really tasty way to enjoy this mushroom. So if you want to access the kind of trippy entheogenic properties of this mushroom, you have to understand the chemistry. So the toxin is ibotenic acid, and that gets chemically converted into muscimol. So it's a decarboxylation reaction, and that can occur when you heat the mushroom or bring it at low pH, bring it down to low pH. So the most common way to do this that people have used historically is to dehydrate and dry the mushroom and then make a tea out of it. And usually you add some lemon juice. So in the process of making the tea, you usually take the dried mushroom, which has had most of the ibotenic acid converted through the drying process and boil it for a little while. And that helps to finish the conversion and doing it at a low pH also helps to uh, convert finish that decarboxylation of ibotenic acid into the entheogenic compound muscimol. So that's chemistry. Um, you do not need to drink reindeer pee to access muscimol. Better living through chemistry, um, you just dry it out and you boil it, you add a little bit of lemon juice, boom, you have muscimol. There's no need to drink pee. <laughs> I, I laugh constantly in my comments when people are like, bro, drink reindeer pee. And you're like, why would you do that? You do not need to drink reindeer pee or someone else's pee. You don't need to drink pee at all. I mean, if that's what you're into, you do you. But uh, if you want to access the effects of what's in this mushroom, you don't need to drink pee. You can just do a little chemistry. Anyhow, uh, muscimol is an entheogenic compound. And so it is a dissociative sedative and it puts you into sort of a uh, lucid delirium. Uh, it can cause sleepiness, wooziness. It is not trippy in the sense of psilocybin, so it doesn't cause uh, euphoria. It doesn't really cause like the kinds of visual distortions that you would get from taking psilocybin. Instead, it puts you in a sort of like a semi dreamy lucidity state um, where, you know, honestly, it's a little bit like a fever dream or being really drunk, honestly, is kind of what it feels like. You lose coordination, you like stumble a little bit, you might slur your words. Um, if you've ever taken a lot of Benadryl and then stayed awake, it feels a little bit like that where you're kind of just like going in and out of consciousness and things are like maybe a little distorted, but it's not trippy in the sense that psilocybin is. So it's a very different effect. Um, the time is different. You consume muscimol and you feel it at about 20 minutes and the effects will last for about two, three hours um, with some lingering effects up to about 10 to 24 hours later, but usually it resolves a little bit faster 
than psilocybin was. And, and honestly, it just puts you to sleep. Uh, I think a lot of people want to hear that this mushroom has some incredible property and it makes you trip balls. And it, it, it doesn't. It makes you sleepy. It's most of what it does. If you consume too much of it, it can put you in a coma for a couple of days. So you may not want to go so hard on Amnita muscaria. But I hear a lot of interest in people who really want to try this mushroom. So you can find it in nature, dry it out, make your own tea. You can buy it probably way overpriced online. Um, there's a huge number of Amnita gummies and other products out there that I'm seeing, and none of them are regulated. None of them have any testing to actually tell you what's inside of them. I don't know if it's Musmol or something else that's in there. You don't know where those mushrooms are coming from. There's a lot of issues with the products that are in the marketplace that people are selling uh, as Amanita muscaria products. Um, and I've been really hesitant to try any of them because I don't know what's in them. I don't know where they're coming from, all this kind of stuff. But I recently talked to a company called Psych Wellness, and they make Calm, which is the first like market-approved patented proprietary uh, Amanita extract tincture that's on the market. Um, you can buy it at Walmart, you can buy it online. It's legal, it's available, it's made in like a pharmaceutical level uh, process facility. They are sourcing their stuff from reputable foragers, everything is coming in and getting processed uh, in safe ways, what's called generally recognized as safe. It's a sort of a food safety type thing. But if you want to try Amanita muscaria, this is by far the safest way to try muscamol. It's also the easiest, because all you got to do is take a dropper, put it under your tongue, wait a little while, see how you feel. Uh, so I've used this a couple times for sleep. Uh, I haven't taken a larger dose and stayed awake to kind of see how I feel, but it mostly just makes me calm and relaxed and I can go to sleep. So if you guys want to try this, you can use code FASTINATEDBYFUNGI in all caps to save 15% on an order from Psyched Wellness. Uh, if you just search for CALM, you'll find it. There's also a link on my website under the mushroom discount tab. So if you guys want to try Amity Muscaria, CALM is the way to go. All right. So let's keep talking because uh, there's there's more mushroom misinformation here about muscaria to, to go into um i guess yeah also like muscamol as a compound is a, is a gaba agonist so it acts similarly in our brains to alcohol to ethanol so it's, it's a depressant and it's a dissociative um, again it's not trippy like psilocybin just to make that really clear okay so did Vikings take this mushroom and eat it before battle to get into a berserker rage? Um, well, given that it's a dissociative sedative and if you eat a lot of it, it makes you either like throw up or have diarrhea, I think it's pretty unlikely that Vikings ate this mushroom before going into battle. Um, the only historical point of reference for that is from like a 17th century poet who sort of heard about the mystique of Vikings going into battle. And by the way, Vikings were just a mixture of people. It was not like an ethnic group. Uh, it was just a bunch of pirates, basically, that were raiding. There's a whole romanticized versions of what Vikings were. And I've certainly fallen into that, like Norse mythology and other things. But anyhow, they were just literal pirates raiding coastal towns. Um, and they definitely did not eat this mushroom before going into battle because they would have been fallen asleep or shit in their pants out on the battlefield. So what is more likely is that Vikings took a plant called henbane, which has analgesic properties and is like mildly psychotrophic. Um, there's a great article out there you can look up. If you just look up, you know, Amanita muscaria, Vikings, skeptic, you'll find this whole article where it lays out the case for henbane. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple and it makes a lot of sense. We don't have any anthropological evidence that Vikings ever consumed Amity Muscaria or even had any real relationship with it. It was just all misinformation that came from one person who made up a story 400 years ago. And this is part of how these myths get started and then perpetuated because it's a fun idea, but it's just not reality nor is it truth. Uh, so I mentioned uh, there is a history of native indigenous people using Amanita muscaria for its entheogenic properties. And that was largely the indigenous groups of the Sami people in Siberia and like Northern Europe. Uh, and I guess there was a documented anthropological evidence of Sami uh, shamans going around collecting muscaria and going to families and gifting them muscaria, uh, not necessarily like at Christmas, but maybe in the winter. So there is some you know, something there that is true. 
uh, and people were known to either potentially drink reindeer pee of reindeers had consumed Amanita muscaria, and there are reindeer who eat muscaria. We don't know if it's for the anthogenic properties or if it's just because it's food and it's got protein. Um, could be both. Why not both? Uh, but there's documented cases, I guess, of people drinking the urine of uh, reindeer or drinking the urine of the shaman because the shaman would eat it, get poisoned, and then the decarboxylation would happen in their liver uh, because it can happen in your liver, not just in a, a pot with boiling water and, and lemon juice. I think that's probably the preferable way to, rather than getting sick. But then people would drink the shaman's pee and get those sort of delirium um, effects. And that's fine. But again, like I said, better living through chemistry. We don't need to drink pee. Uh, instead, you can try the calm tincture, which I guarantee you tastes better than pee. In fact, this, this tastes pretty good. Um, I, I haven't drank pee, but I can't imagine it tastes great. <laughs> okay, uh, so like I said, there is that association of shamans going around and giving out muscaria, and that leads us next to the idea of this sort of psychedelic Santa Claus and the origins of Santa Claus having to do with this uh, indigenous tradition of giving, gifting muscaria uh, potentially in winter months. So there's zero evidence for that from an anthropological, anthropological point of view. Uh, the current manifestation of St. Nicholas as a figure that we know him uh, comes from uh, the Netherlands in the 18th century. And there's a whole weird problematic history. You can look up like Black Pete and all this stuff. Um, but basically, St. Nick, uh, who was a real person, uh, was sort of canonized as a saint uh, in the 18th century, many centuries after he died. Uh, he was characterized often as like a sailor. He was usually wearing blue. Uh, and he had several different outfit changes he went through over the years. But none of them were red and white. Uh, and the current obsession with Santa Claus being red and white, and thus the link to Amnita muscaria, uh, comes from Coca-Cola ads in the 1930s. And so there's a long history of depicting St. Nick in various ways, but it wasn't really until these Coca-Cola ads in the 1930s where he became this big, fat, jolly white guy with a beard and a red and white suit. Um, there is some old German postcards, I think, of like a St. Nick and Amity Muscaria um, depicted in the same place, but that's not linked, nor is he shown as being red and white in those. Um, so this is one of the most common uh, pieces of m misinformation that goes viral every single year because it makes a great story, right? You know, people are like, well, the, the reindeer would eat the Amity Muscaria and get high and people would like get the stuff from the shaman and that has to do with Santa Claus. And it's a whole nice story, but none of it's true. And that's one of the problems of misinformation is it makes such a good, compelling story that people share it every single year. And when I was first getting into mushrooms, I got excited about it and shared it too. And then I learned more about it. And every year, I have tried to put forth some information where I'm helping people think more critically about this story. And honestly, people don't want to hear it. People get upset. No one wants me to ruin their little Santa Claus Amity Muscaria story. But it's just not true. So if you want to read more about it, there's a great article called The Myth of the Psychedelic Santa. It's got a pretty good breakdown on how these things aren't true. Uh, there's also a great podcast episode from Attention the Mind, uh, debunking the mushroom Santa hypothesis. So those are two resources you can go read or listen to and learn more about the subject. Okay, so we're going to go on to some of the other common pieces of mushroom information that I hear and the myths that are sort of constantly being uh, propagated out there. And particularly a lot of this comes from um, false statements made on the Joe Rogan podcast uh, by a very famous mushroom personality. And I hope someday that I get to sit down with that mushroom personality and have a conversation. We get to clear the air on a couple of these things and have a conversation. Um, because as far as I know, he's never actually issued any kind of public retractions for the statements he's made. Uh, and there's still a lot of questions that I get on a daily basis. Whenever I live stream, I always get asked about these things and I have to feel like a broken record giving the same answers again and again and again. Um, so I'm hoping that by doing this podcast and talking about this stuff in a kind of a metered, uh, critical way that I can share this information, this critical take with a, a broader audience. And if you are someone who listens and this resonates with you, you can share this podcast episode with your friends and family who have a tendency to kind of repeat some of the misinformation they may have heard, uh, particularly on the Joe Rogan podcast, because 
it's sort of insidious how it seeps into everything and people who get excited about mushrooms hear this misinformation well before they actually see the sort of better quality information that does exist. So I'm going to start out with my um, least favorite mushroom myth, and it's also sort of the most commonly thing, commonly seen thing that I have commented on my posts. And it's uh, all mushrooms are edible, some only once. And I think this is originally uh, attributed to Terry Pratchett, who's a phenomenal author, and I love his work. Um, but I don't, I don't love this quote uh, because it is confusing the issue. Um, basically, the I, the joke here, and I I do get the joke, is that eating a mushroom. You can eat anything, but it might kill you, right? So only once. Um, but the truth is there's a wide variety of mushrooms. There's probably theoretically about 40, 50,000 species of mushrooms with probably another 100,000 more or so. Uh, out of all of those mushrooms, many of them would literally be impossible to eat. They're either too small, too slimy, they're too woody. Uh, you couldn't consume them as food. And the definition of edible is suitable to be eaten as food. So if there's something that is not food-like, it doesn't matter if it's toxic or not, you can't eat it. So it's not edible. And I know people will argue the semantics on this, but I think it's an important point to make. And I always try to put forth the idea that, you know, out of 50,000 something mushrooms, there's probably a couple hundred that are really good to eat. There's probably a couple hundred that are really toxic. And then there's a small sliver that are psychoactive. And that's another thing I want to get at is a lot of people have this perception that mushrooms are one of those three categories, right? You can either eat them, they're either poisonous or they're psychoactive. And they have to fit, every, every mushroom has to fit into that, those three categories. And that's absolutely not true. Most mushrooms are just mushrooms. They exist to be mushrooms. They do not have to serve a purpose for us. They do not have to do anything for us. They exist to propagate mycelium and spread spores. And that's why they're here, right? Uh, and I think that's, that's just a really important to keep in mind is that, you know, mushrooms are not drugs. They, they can be, they can be medicinal, they can be edible, they can be toxic. There's a gradation of toxicity. Not everything is deadly toxic. Some things just might give you severe GI upset. Some things might be long-term toxic. They might be carcinogenic. Some things might be really short-term toxic and that they'll resolve in a couple of hours. There's so much to learn about mushrooms. And I hope that in listening to this episode, you have listened to past episodes where I've, I've talked about some of these things a little more at length. Uh, but basically, I just want to say that not all mushrooms are edible. Some, not even once. So that's my take on it. Uh, let's jump into some of the statements that have been made on the Joe Rogan show. So there's one I hear a lot. Uh, when people ask me about portobellos and are, are portobellos dangerous? And what's this mushroom mafia? Well, Let's talk about it. So portobellos uh, are Agaricus bisporus, and they are the same mushroom as button mushrooms, cremini, baby bellas. They're all Agaricus bisporus. White button mushrooms are a different strain of Agaricus bisporus that was selected for being white. So now they have sort of albino ones. Uh, but they're basically all the same mushroom. They're grown in the same way in, in composted chicken poo, usually. Uh, usually in big racks, they're often done in the dark, usually inside, they can be, you know, moist, cool areas. And really, they're just the same mushroom, but they're graded by size. And the white ones are, you know, marginally different, but they're all the same thing. So these mushrooms are safe to eat raw. There was a statement saying that they were not safe to eat raw. But if you go back, and actually look at the primary literature, there's been a lot of, you know, evidence saying that they are safe to eat raw, because this is a big thing in the mushroom industry. Mushrooms are served raw at salad bars all the time. I don't like eating Agaricus bisporus raw, and I don't necessarily recommend you do it because if you eat a lot of it, you can feel sick from having too much raw chitin, and we can't digest chitin. It can give you a tummy ache. Some people are more sensitive or less sensitive than others, but there is no toxin in raw Agaricus bisporus that you need to worry about. What was referred to is there are wild species of agaricus, not agaricus bisporus, but maybe even a wild strain of agaricus bisporus that has been shown to have a little bit of agaritin, which is a hydrazine. So it's the same kind of toxin that's in Jeromitra. Uh, it's even in morels. If you eat a raw morel, you can die. And there was about you know 40 people who got sick last summer from like a sushi restaurant in uh, Montana that was serving like 
marinated morels. They were putting morels in like soy sauce, but not cooking them. And a whole bunch of people got sick and some people died from hydrazine poisoning. So raw agaricus can have hydrazine in it, the agaritin uh, compound. And so I would always recommend if you're foraging and collecting wild uh, agaricus that you cook them. I, like I said, I don't eat raw portobellos, but you can eat them safely. And the whole mushroom mafia was a thing that if someone goes on and trashes uh, this particular mushroom, which is literally the most common mushroom in America, you might think that like the mushroom council that uh, grows and is like the advocacy group for people to eat more mushrooms might not want him to say that. And I think he knew that. And so, but he created this whole sort of false narrative around the idea that portobellos were unsafe to eat raw and that there was some special mushroom mafia. Uh, no, he was just being incendiary and there should really be a retraction and maybe an apology and explanation for those statements. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see that with Joe Rogan because that's not how that guy operates. Uh, there was another piece of information that was brought up or another theory that was brought up. Uh, and this is one I hear a lot and I, I don't love it, but, but let's talk about it. It's the, the stoned ape theorem. So I believe this was a Dennis McKenna idea. And this was the idea that, you know, ancient human tribes, uh, as they moved from trees onto grasslands and they were tracking the migration of, you know, buffalo, water buffalo, things like this in, in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, that they were finding piles of, of animal poo that had psilocybe mushrooms growing on them and that they started eating psilocybe mushrooms. And then that created sort of an accelerated evolution of human language and culture uh, in the sense of having our, our minds opened and blown by consuming psilocybin. So it's a fun idea. It's totally the kind of idea that makes sense if you're on mushrooms already and you're like, yes, of course, that makes sense. But unfortunately, as with most other things, there's no evidence for it. There's absolutely no data. There's no anthropological evidence. There's no uh, genetic evidence. We have the ability to look at our genome and track it over time and despite people saying stuff to the contrary. There's a huge and long, well-documented history of how Homo sapiens evolved from a lot of intermediate species and how we kind of like all glom together. I mean, Neanderthals, Denovians, we, we have their DNA in our DNA today. You can see it. We incorporated those populations into modern humanity. Uh, but there is no record of a point where we had this massive jump in cognition uh, due to the consumption of psilocybin. Uh, there is, however, a long history of people looking at genes like the FOX2P gene having to do with the evolution of language and comparing that across different homo, like, you know, homo species and uh, primates and stuff like that. So, again, there's no evidence for the stone date theorem. It's a nice idea, um, but I think it's, it's untrue. And until I'm willing to change my mind if someone has compelling evidence, but I don't think we can assume it's true unless we actually have some data that indicates it might be true. And at the moment we have none. Uh, there's also the idea that mushrooms and fungi uh, came from outer space. And that is absolutely no basis in fact. Uh, you can look at, again, genetic history, phylogeny, uh, the amount and sequences of DNA in a genome and track backwards uh, using a sort of these next gen tools we have. Uh, and it looks like fungi, you know, diverged from animals about 1.2 billion years ago. And, and they're part of the same common ancestry of all eukaryotic life that evolved here on earth. And fungi are good at like taking up external DNA and doing weird things with their genomes, but we don't have any evidence that DNA at any point came from another planet. This does not mean that somehow DNA and the molecules for life may have come in on an asteroid and like that nucleated life on this planet. There is a sort of xenobiotic uh, theory about that, but there's also theories that maybe life started down in the deep ocean and it was all based on RNA originally. Uh, I don't have a strong feeling one way or another, but I, I don't think that mushrooms and fungi came from outer space unless the rest of life also did. Um, although they can look pretty alien if you've ever seen in Clathrus archerii or any stinkhorns, they look really bizarre. So I, I totally understand that um, idea. But again, we don't have any evidence that fungi did anything but evolved here on Earth with the rest of life. And they've also worked very much in synergy with all other forms of life. So it's not like they came in as a new actor on the scene. They're, they've been fundamental to building our planet up from day one. Well, 
day one of life evolving kind of thing. So uh, let's see. There's another one that the idea that turkey tails cure cancer. So this is getting at the idea of like medicinal mushrooms having tremendous value uh, in a clinical medical sense. And what I can say with full certainty is that the polysaccharides in mushrooms and fungi can have immunomodulatory effects. So they can stimulate our immune system. Um, they may also repress our immune system in certain cases or depending on what polysaccharide is, depending on the dosage. We don't know. That's why we say immunomodulatory because it could go up or down. Uh, there is quite a bit of evidence and studies that have come out of Asia using a thing called PSK, or polysaccharide K extract of uh, turkey tail. And usually these are made, to be very clear about it, turkey tail is a little wiry polypore. Uh, they are growing the mycelium of turkey tail in liquid culture and then making an extract of that product. And that's what's been used as PSK or PSP in Asia for a lot of clinical studies having to do with cancer patients. And what they've seen is administering PSK and PSP as part of a chemotherapeutic regimen. It's what's called an adjuvant. So they're taking chemotherapy and then they're adding this adjuvant to it. You know, take two grams of this a day along with your chemotherapy. Has resulted in better health outcomes for people uh, over like a five year span after their cancer and they've dealt with this stuff. And it, it's not an all or nothing. Like the people who take it still die and the people who don't take it still survive. But it does appear to help stimulate your immune system when your immune system is really knocked down because of the chemo. And then that leads to better outcomes, health outcomes for people post cancer. It doesn't cure the cancer, but it does appear that it has a beneficial effect in a long-term sense. So if you know someone who has a cancer diagnosis is undergoing chemotherapy, by all means, get them some turkey tail uh, products to take but don't expect, you know, if you are diagnosed with cancer, don't take turkey tail and think you're going to cure your cancer. You're, you're going to die. So please go get medical advice and by all means take medicinal mushrooms, you know, with the advice of your doctor, looking into dosage, um, all this effectiveness. The other thing I want to bring up is that the PSK extract is made with liquid mycelium. So it's grown in liquid culture and so it's very concentrated and liquid culture mycelium and fruiting bodies tend to be very very concentrated in the bioactive molecules and polysaccharides that are there if you get mycelium that is grown on grain it's going to be 80 to 90 percent grain even when it gets myceliated it's still mostly plant matter so if you're buying powdered mycelium and taking that it is not as effective in a clinical sense as it would be if you're taking a psk extract or even something made from a fruiting body. So again, that is something to keep in mind as you see the kind of marketing materials and stories that are told around turkey tail. I do think it has a real benefit for cancer, especially it's been shown to be very effective and helpful in uh, people surviving GI cancer, so bowel and stomach-based cancers, but not necessarily for breast cancer or for other types of cancer. And again, there's a lot of studies on this. It does look like turkey tail has a positive uh, impact on people who are undergoing chemotherapy, but it doesn't cure their cancer. It's just part of keeping your immune system active and going uh, when it's otherwise struggling. So there's another statement um, that mycelium is like the internet of nature. And I like that metaphor because it's approachable and it helps people think about how like trees and other things may be connected through this common mycelial network or what's called the wood wide web. But there's a big counterpoint to that, that things are like far more complex and much more nuanced and less synergistic in the soil. There's a lot more competition going on than things just kind of like freely exchanging information. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of bias in the popular media that trees are all like helping each other and there's a sort of big underground kumbaya hippie commune thing happening and we don't actually have any evidence to support that. There is in a very limited context uh, has been shown that trees can send nutrients back and forth and some of it is transferred by the mycelial network but it's not really clear like the source sync dynamics like is it giving is it receiving or is it just like diffusion and it's like you know sort of pure chemistry and biology why these things are moving around or is it done with intention. And that's what we're still trying to figure out. So like I said, the idea of mycelium as the internet is a nice gateway concept, but it really fails to describe the true complexity of the situation. And the last episode I did on mycorrhizal networks, I talked a little bit more 
more about that if you want to get some more background. Um, the idea of network intelligence in mycelium and in slime molds is really interesting in the sense that every little growing tip is almost like its own brain and that it can make decisions. Do I go right? Do I go left? Do I go up? Do I go down? Uh, is there nutrients over there? Is there competition over there? Is it, is it too hot? Is it too wet? You know, where do I want to go? Um, each little tip can make decisions like that. And then all of those tips across a network are coordinated. And that's a really interesting concept. Like, well, how does that happen? And I talked about this on the communication episode. Um, there's been hypotheses that maybe it's due to like electrical signaling, but there's only really one guy who's explored that. And I think he's taking the concept a little bit far and applying algorithms that are making it do and the data do and say things that aren't necessarily there. Um, so he's sort of mining for something that I think he's projecting what he wants to be true onto these uh, fungi and mycelium. And I, I think there is, there's some out research coming out that shows that like mycelium uses electrical signaling somehow to, to, it corresponds with activity in the environment like rainfall or fruiting. Um, but we're not clear on what its role is or how it's being utilized. And even if it is related to communication within or across the mycelial network, there is however, pretty good evidence for little bi-directional specialized tubes within mycelium um, that are almost think of it like the sort of pneumatic tubing in a building where you put a little thing goes and it sucks up and ends up, you know, three stories up. So there's tubes like that within mycelium that are sort of dedicated to long term or long uh, distance transport, moving metabolites and signaling molecules across the mycelium, allowing it to coordinate its behavior. Um, slime mold similarly has that network intelligence and it's been used to trace various uh, geographic maps and sort of mimic what humans have, have figured out in terms of top topography and uh, putting in uh, railways and roads and stuff like that. But slime mold isn't intelligent in any cognitive sense. It just is really good at navigating mazes because it's down in the soil all the time searching for food. And so that's, that's what it does. And we're just showing it that it can do that in a more artificial context. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's smart or it's intelligent. Um, but it is does display this network intelligence and is very good at sensing its environment and even learning from and corresponding to stuff. So I think we need to consider fungal intelligence, but under a very different umbrella than the way we consider animal intelligence and cognition. Uh, are cordyceps going to cause a zombie apocalypse and a big term uh, infection of humanity? No, no, they're not. <laughs> you know, Last of Us is a phenomenal sci-fi concept but it's just not realistic. Uh, in that show and video game, there's an idea that somehow cordyceps jump the species barrier and take over humans and turn us into sort of these infected zombie-like creatures. And the reality of it is that cordyceps can infect humans. They cause like a mild skin rash. The human body is very different from that of an insect. We have a lot of tissues. We have a very complex immune system. Uh, we have vascular tissue, circulatory system, uh, skin. Epidermis is actually pretty good at resisting lots of stuff. Uh, insects are more just like a little hard shell of chitin with a bunch of like what's called hemolymph inside, sort of goo. So all the fungi has to do with the insect is get through the hard outside and then the yummy inside is just full of stuff that it can grow mycelium through and completely take over. And in one of those infected ants that crawls up and has a mushroom grow out of its head, little sort of zombie infected cicada or a zombie infected ant thing, uh, is because its body is completely colonized by that mycelium. Up to like 70% of the mass of that insect will be, you know, filled with mycelium. And there's a really interesting question there about like, that's the idea of an extended phenotype and how is mycelium, which has no eyes or nose or sense of direction, able to like locomote an ant up a plant and then grow a mushroom out of its head. It's crazy. It's really, really cool. But it's not going to happen in humans because, again, we have a very different immune system. We have very different tissue. Mycelium cannot just grow through human tissue unless we have a complete breakdown of our immune system. And this isn't to say that fungal diseases aren't a big deal for humans. There's a wide variety of some really scary mycoses or fungal diseases that can happen to us. But it's not going to be cordyceps evolving so quickly or even being genetically manipulated to infect humans. They tend to be very specific to their hosts, 
Um, like I said, they, they can infect humans. They generally cause like a, a mild skin rash. Or if they did infect a human and become a systemic infection, say someone who had like zero immune systems, they were suffering from AIDS or something like that, it, it might kill them. But it would at no point would it turn them into this infected zombie thing. Um, also, in the show, there's a whole thing about zombies bite you and then you get infected within like 12 hours. That, that makes absolutely no sense. Um, fungi reproduce and spread by spores, usually not by like physical contact. Uh, you know, in theory, like maybe a chunk of mycelium could get into someone else, but fungi tend to grow very, very slowly. And fungal diseases take a long time to get established and also a long time to get rid of. We do have a good number of, of uh, azoles and various antifungal drugs that we can use, certainly not as many as we do for bacteria, but we do have them. They're generally pretty effective. Um, there are a few fungi that are emerging that have real, uh, pose a real threat from a pathogenic standpoint. There's one called Candida auris, which has become kind of a super bug and got really um, big in hospitals over COVID because people were constantly wearing masks and covered up and it seemed to propagate in kind of wet, uh, humid environments like the inside of your mask. And Candida auris has now picked up various uh, resistances to some fungal, antifungal drugs that we have. And so it's causing major issues in hospitals um, for infections that can't be treated. Um, but it doesn't turn you into an infected zombie. It just causes like some really bad rashes or systemic infections, which can unfortunately lead to death. Um, but at no point do you become a zombie or start infecting other people uh, fungal diseases tend to move very slowly and have very low transmissibility. Uh, and one of the most common ones that I hear all the time is that touching mushrooms is dangerous, right? It's the most common thing I see in a video. People are like, eh, I love that you're doing this, but like you should really wash your hands. And oh my God, he touched a toxic mushroom. Uh, the compounds in mushrooms do not diffuse across your skin. So the vast majority of toxins in mushrooms you can eat them and get sick because they will get processed in your liver and become problematic, but the toxins in mushrooms don't permeate your skin. So even if you touch it, it's really not a big deal because you're not getting, you know, if it's a deadly amanita like a death cap, you're not getting tons of amatoxins on your fingers. They're still in the mushroom. So I would don't do this, but you can take a bite of a death cap and spit it out and you'll be fine. And there's guys around the Bay Area who've done this for years just as a demonstration to other people and for the shock value they're still alive. There is one mushroom and it's not, it is a mushroom, but it's an ascomycete and it's trichoderma, the fire coral. It grows around the South Pacific Rim uh, in I think pieces, parts of China and Japan and Australia. And it looks poisonous. It's this tendril, red tendrils. Um, and it does contain trithocene toxins, which can diffuse across skin. It's actually the same kind of toxins that are in like newts and some kinds of shellfish. Uh, and those, it's also produced by various molds like trichoderma, and this is why it's made in this mushroom because that trichoderma teleomorphic form is actually a mushroom. Uh, and that one can diffuse across your skin. So if you picked up the mushroom and you really touched it a lot, you, you might get sick, but I've heard from a bunch of people that they picked up the mushroom, been totally fine. You need to hold it for like a long time for enough of that toxin to diffuse into your skin. If you really rub it all over your hand, it can cause pretty bad contact dermatitis. But for the most part, I don't think I've really heard of anyone dying from just touching a fire coral. There are some reported deaths from people consuming it, but not just from touching it. So mushrooms in general are safe to touch. There's a few things like the goo on a soilus or the black insides of an earth ball that might give you a rash or some form of dermatitis. But again, if you have sensitive skin, you can wear gloves while you're at foraging and, and yeah, wash your hands when you get home. But touching mushrooms is a safe thing to do. Kids can touch mushrooms. Adults can touch mushrooms. Old people can touch mushrooms. Everybody can touch mushrooms safely. Just don't eat them unless you know what they are. And also, very good advice, don't go around picking up random mushrooms and trying to eat them raw. Not a good idea. However, you can pick them up and look at them. And then this gets to my point of a lot of people see my content, see my videos, and accuse me of like hurting nature. And I hope from the people who listen to my podcast, you get that I am deeply vested in conservation, in protecting you know, natural and wild spaces and being an advocate for fungi. Uh, I, I love, love mushrooms. I don't wanna hurt them. I don't wanna hurt nature. The thing that people conflate here is that they see me picking something and they're like, well, you're killing it. And it's like, well, mushrooms are the temporary reproductive structure of the mycelium below, like a fruit or a flower. And in the same way that if you pick a flower or you pick a fruit, you don't kill the tree or the plant attached to it. So if you pick the mushroom, you don't kill the mycelium. Over time, if you remove all the mushrooms and no spores are getting spread, you might be impacting mycelium populations. So there's something to be said 
for the idea of like an honorable harvest and sustainable harvest, but simply picking up a mushroom doesn't kill the mycelium. Uh, in many cases, what I do is I pick up a mushroom, I take photos, I document it, and if I'm not gonna take that mushroom home to eat, I put it right back down in the soil and it continues spreading spores. A lot of mushrooms too will even continue to open up and mature after their connection to the mycelium has been severed. It's not a big deal, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, what I've actually noticed on certain hikes is that if I come back a week later, the mushrooms I didn't pick have rotted away and the one that I picked actually dried out and it's continuing to spread its spores. So I'm not saying that picking mushrooms uh, is gonna be a, a good thing, but it's certainly not a bad thing. And in the only really long-term study done about mushroom harvesting, uh, it actually concluded that human foraging activity may be good because in plots that were untouched versus ones where people were actively gathering mushrooms for 30 years, there was more fruiting bodies and there was more fungal diversity when animals were there messing around with mushrooms. And if you think of the way that mushrooms evolved, many of them are very eye-catching. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of mushrooms, like truffles, like stinkhorns, that recruit animals to come mess around with them to help them spread their spores. And so I think the fact that so many mushrooms are visually appealing might have an evolutionary advantage for the mushroom that an animal is gonna come over and be like, ooh, what's this thing? And mess around with it, eat some, help move the spores around. It's not a bad thing to necessarily go out and touch mushrooms and it's not killing anything. What's really harming mushroom populations worldwide and on a global scale is climate change. So for all the people who are so upset about seeing someone harvest a mushroom or pick a mushroom, save that energy for corporations, for governments, for militaries, uh, for people who are, you know, the oil companies that are continuing to cause climate change and not your local foragers who are out there helping to uh, act as stewards of the land and educating people about mushrooms. So anyhow, there is my, my manifesto about mushrooms and misinformation and myths. Uh, hopefully you can learn something from this and, and share it with others. Uh, I am sad to say that this, this podcast in its current form uh, will, be, will be ending because the app that's hosted on is shutting down. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do next. I have a lot more ideas for podcast episodes that I want to record. Uh, I will certainly continue working on new episodes and new concepts and I will be back at some point with another iteration of the Fascinated by Fungi podcast. I'm not sure where I'm going to host it or who's going to sponsor it or if I'm going to have a co-host or, or anything like that. It'd be cool to like have a nice bit of music and like I said if there's any podcast producers out there who'd, who'd like to work with me I would love some help as I don't have the bandwidth to do this myself or even how to figure out how to use RSS feeds or any of that stuff but for the time being these podcast episodes will live here on YouTube and I also put them all up on my Patreon. Uh, and I, I have a Patreon, and I would love to have more supporters and subscribers um, because it really does help me on you know a daily, monthly basis to have support from you guys in making my dreams come true. I'm working on a mushroom book. It's going to be out at the end of 2024. I just submitted uh, not a complete final draft, but a pretty major draft, and I'm going to get it uh, coded, and I'm going to get to see the whole, the whole manuscript looks, and I'm figuring out all my photos and my illustrations. My foreword just got written by Eugenia Bone. Uh, I got a lot of really good things coming out, and I'm so excited to share them with you guys. And I'm, I'm just so grateful, I guess, for this incredible opportunity I've had to teach people and uh, get to share my passion with mushrooms. And, and the best that I can hope is that you are also fascinated by fungi. So anyhow, thank you guys so much for joining me. Uh, thank you so much for being here and... You know, I appreciate the heck out of you guys. Thank you.